Okay, so we're going to talk about Congress today. The first thing is congressional approval. If you look over the past, uh, let's say uh, 40 years, I think it's 50 years I have up here, right? Congressional approval has never been particularly great, okay? We see some highs um, in the late 90s and we see a spike in 02. What's the congressional approval spike in 02? right? Any sort of rally around the flag, any sort of consolidation of um, this idea that the government's doing a good job is all going to be kind of centered around that 9-11 attack. And so, uh, but as you can see, it's still not great. It got down to a low of nine, right? Um, we went into the midterms with it around 20 to 25, okay? Beno has this paradox, and I ask about this question. As a matter of fact, I think it's a question that shows up again um, on your final exam. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the paradox is this. We re-elect our members of Congress at a super high rate, but we paint the institution. So what's going on? Well, a few things. Service to the district and state. Uh, I, I don't think I've told you guys this. But in April, I have a little bit of an IRS problem. I filed my taxes in late March, and I got back a rejection about three days before taxes are due saying, oh, we're not going to accept your tax filing. And I was like, what? This has never happened before. This is very upsetting. And it had to do with the fact that I had had foster children for all of 2021 and for about half of 2020. And these foster children, there are four of them, I claimed on my taxes for 2021. Not for 2020, because I only had them for four months, four and a half months of 2020. Um, so that's not enough, and that would be illegal, right? But as it turns out, their biological parents, who had also had them for four and a half months, had claimed them in 2020, and also claimed them in 2021. Which meant that because they filed their taxes first, they got the child tax credits for four children they had not had their home for, at that point, 19 months, right? So that meant that I had to go through this whole process. I had to do an appeals process. I had to do all sorts of things that I was, just so you know, very anxious. I do not do well with individual paperwork. I'm more of a big idea kind of person. That's what I do well at, right? And so details sometimes slip past me and I don't enjoy it. And I had to file these taxes, so I had already spent the time doing the details. And the thought of doing it again was not a thought I would enjoy, right? And my husband says, hey, let's take this to Tom Cole. And I say, yeah, take it to Tom Cole, right? Tom Cole is the representative for our district in the state of Oklahoma, they said, this is what you need to do, and we will follow the process and try to fast track it. As it turns out, fast tracking turned out to be um, September 30th. So that was not particularly fast. Nonetheless, Tom Cole's office was super helpful, providing a service specifically to someone in his constituency, to his district and state. That is a service, right? If your um, grandmother doesn't get her social security check, she should talk to the representative. If there is a problem filing something on your student loans, you should talk to your representative, okay? This service means that people feel closely connected to their representative. Whether they like Congress or not, it means they have strong, warm feelings for this person. <laughs> Communication with constituents. They send out what's called Frank's mail. The great thing about being a member of Congress is that you can send out all the mail you want and you don't have to pay for it. Frank is paid for as part of the communication you're doing with your constituents. If you use it well, then your constituents feel like you care about them because you receive 
they receive letters from you, right? Communication is important. Uh, that personal bond I was talking about, you know, we shook hands once. I actually worked for Tom Cole whenever he ran a, uh, he, he has a polling firm in the state of Oklahoma. Cole Hargraves Hargra Snodgrass Association, right? It's him. I worked for that whenever I was in college a thousand years ago, right? And so um, I know him. I had a conversation with him. I have a personal bond. High visibility. We see our member of Congress on local news. They show up to football, high school football games or college football games. They show up to um, parades. They appear whenever some a new road is being opened. They have high visibility. And then finally, they do this thing that in political science terms, we call advertising, credit claiming, and positioning, okay? When they do something that is good for the district, they advertise it, right? Hey, look. That Lindsay Street extension, that's because of what I did. Hey, look, because of this, this is what I did. And even if all they did was vote on it, or, for example, lots and lots of representatives are claiming, um, and, and governors are claiming that they did this thing in terms of getting money into their districts from the Inflation Reduction Act or the Infrastructure Act. When in fact they actually voted against it. But they're like, here comes the money. Uh, thanks, thanks to Congress, right? Yes, thanks to Congress, not thanks to you personally, but constituents don't know that. And they don't look into it. They advertise it and they claim credit. I voted for it. Okay. I co-sponsored it. They're gonna advertise, they're gonna credit claim, and then they're gonna position themselves. Is something important. If I were to poll you, my constituency, about things you cared most about, okay, the weather in this class, right? You know, what should the thermostat be set at, right? If I were to ask you about the chairs, do you like the fact that the chairs swivel, or would you rather that they weren't attached and pulled out? If I were to ask you about the color of this room and the decoration, right? And I were to ask all these things and say, or my slides, for example, I've heard are a little dull. You guys don't like them. You want them to be white lettering on dark slides. I didn't have time to redo this, right? But if I ask the questions, right? And I said to you, hey, look, what do I need to do? And I listen to you, it doesn't cost me anything to say, just like all of you, I wish the thermostat was set at 70 degrees. Just like all of you, I think that this color needs a redo. Just like all of you, I think my slides are best whenever it's white lettering on dark slides. Woo. Right? So when we talk about this, that means that I am reading the room and on things that I agree with you or I don't care about, I position myself in a way that reflects what you want, okay? So people like their representatives, okay? But they have a problem with Congress because they have seen Congress as being ineffectual at answering the nation's problems. They are concerned about the policy process. And I'll tell you, they're concerned that it's not open and fair, but I will also tell you that believe me, it's very, very open, okay? Which is actually why people don't like it. We'll get to that in a second. How effective it is. If you are elected, everything should change tomorrow. Right? And it doesn't. And that gets really frustrating to people. And then finally, you can't really bond. It's an institution. It's a building. There's not a face. And not all of you were set in front of congressional hearings at age three by your father and told, this is a good thing. This is democracy. Right? Like I was. I thought, 
that institutional model was a normal thing, right? Incumbency is going to increase the chance of reelection because of this advertising, this credit claiming, and this position taking. But also because incumbents outspend challengers 12 to 1. 12 to 1. They're also held by districting or gerrymandering. Their districts are drawn in such a way by the state legislature to ensure that they don't have real challenges. Okay? So they're going to outspend. They have a partisan lean in their favor. And you've just connected with them on all these issues. Here are the district maps with lean. Okay? In other words, See, we, we have these kind of uh, two, Florida here and also Missouri. That's just, I didn't have, I didn't have the data for them, okay? But everything that's in red is a partisan lean. And the darker red it is, the darker the partisan lean for the Republican Party. Everything that is in blue is a Democratic lean. And the darker the blue, the more the lean, the lighter the blue, the less the lean. The ones that don't have a real lean are some toss ups. See that little bitty um, white bit in Colorado? See this one down here at the bottom of Nevada? Up here in Oregon and Washington? Over here along the coast? Some in Illinois? Right? Not many districts are toss ups. And the darker those colors, the more the lean is drawn. Oklahoma County. How many of you um, live in Oklahoma County? One, two, okay. Oklahoma County has three U.S. representatives because of the way that the maps were redrawn after the census. So that there are three different representatives peeking in to Oklahoma County. Why? Because that makes more sense? Because Oklahoma County is that divisive? Because it's just three slices across the middle? Yes. So that there's not a leaning area. So that there's not a toss-up area. Right? It's not even a heavy blue. It's just not pale pink. Right? And so that districting was done to help people keep their district. The efficiency gap, this is the calculation of lost votes and lost seats due to gerrymandering. Right? Texas gets an extra about six seats. California is an extra for Republicans. California gets an extra three seats for Democrats. Ohio gets an extra two seats for Republicans. Illinois gets an extra two seats for Democrats. New York gets an extra two. Georgia gets an extra two for Republicans. Wisconsin gets an extra two for Republicans. New Jersey gets an extra two for Democrats. Republicans get an extra two in South Carolina and Iowa and Tennessee and in Connecticut. Um, Democrats maybe get an extra two and an extra one in Massachusetts. Add those numbers up over time, right? And then think about also what we're talking about for community and the idea of a congressional district. Now, when we talk about members of Congress, you should first understand this. Mayhew is going to say in the 1970s, he's going to say, members of Congress are single minded seekers of reelection. In other words, they do not care about anything except what? Getting reelected. 
And so they will do whatever it takes for that to happen. Now, Fino, again, we have Fino's paradox. We're going to talk a lot about Fino. Fino is a name you should know, all right? Because he's going to come back in another second, too, three times, right? Um, and not just because he's a nice guy, but also because he did the most work in this area. He said, ah, yes, re-election is definitely a goal, but they have other goals, too. One is good public policy. Now, I need for you guys to listen to me for a second, okay? Good public policy. Whenever I say this, whenever I say, yeah, that's good public policy, I'm not saying it is good in that I agree with it. It is not good that you agree with it. It is not morally good. It is not ethically good. What I'm saying is it is substantive. Right? And this is what I believe as a member of Congress is good public policy. Okay? So substantive and the member of Congress believes it to be the best public policy. Okay? Not necessarily me, not necessarily you. Okay? The second is, uh, the third is power in the body. We have members of Congress who see their route to power and representation through their power in the body. So, for example, the highest serving um, person from the state of Oklahoma is ever in history? Carl Albert. Carl Albert, Speaker of the House, right? Because that puts him third in line to the presidency. But also the speaker is the most, you know, actually the second most um, highly elected official, right? There's a president and a vice president because that's tied together, okay? But the speaker of the house is elected by members of Congress. Quick question, does the speaker of the house have to be a member of Congress? No. Right? And that'll come up in a little bit. Think about Liz Cheney in this particular year. Okay? The Speaker of the House does not have to be a member of the House. House incumbents almost always win over 90% of the time. And they win with more than 60% of the votes. That's a big deal. Senate members also win most of the time, but it's usually a much closer margin. States are more difficult to gerrymander. States are more difficult to gerrymander. Now, which is not to say they're not what we would call red states or blue states, but. So how do members of Congress make decisions? They look at their constituents for salient issues. Have we talked about salient yet? Okay, I think we did. But I'm going to remind you about it, okay? So a salient issue means that the people in their district, what? Number one, know about it. And number two, care about it, right? They know about it and they care about it. So you guys ready? Okay. How many of you have an opinion about abortion? Raise your hand. That's a salient issue. How many of you have an opinion about trade with Macau? Where's Macau? <laughs> That's the question, right? You guys don't. It's not a salient issue, which means me as a representative do not, I do not need to, nor should I listen to you. Because you guys as a whole are not informed enough to talk to me about that. Right? How many of you have an opinion about health care? A salient issue. How many of you have an opinion about toll roads? Less of a salient issue. Okay, I can maybe get away with kind of not listening to you. Okay, 
caucuses. In other words, I caucus with my party, but also I might caucus with the peanut caucus because I have a lot of peanut growers in my area or the oil caucus or the wheat caucus, right? That's across party lines. The women's caucus, the black caucus, the Latino caucus, right? Across party lines. Interest groups, interest groups, we've talked about interest groups and their influence. Colleagues, somebody I really trust, hey, I respect this person, and they serve on the banking committee, and I don't know anything about this bill, and so I'm going to ask them a question, right? How are you going to vote on this? I'm going to vote for it. Okay, and I'll vote for it too, because I respect you. We're aligned on a lot of other issues, and I don't know enough. Okay, party, this is going to be the number one cue. People are going to vote with their party more than with any other group. And then their staff. A lot of times they hire people to think about what it is their position would be on things and to write memos and to help them do their best in terms of their own ideological group. All right, this is my third Venom slide. After this slide, I'm going to take attendance too, okay? But my third FINO slide, so pay attention. In 1977, FINO walks around and he says, hey, look, the thing is, is that individual members of Congress are going to represent their districts exactly the same way. They're going to represent the interests of their constituents in descending order. And it's going to start in that very middle small group, their personal group. Sometimes you guys come to me and you say, you know, Dr. Rallet, I think you should run for Congress. And I say, ha, no. Okay. But you come to me and maybe someday I get mad enough or I get invigorated enough or I think I want to do that. And a group of students come to me and say, hey, you know, I think you ought to run for Congress. And I say, yeah, I do too. And then I have people from the faculty senate come to me. And they're like, hey, you know, you've been really outspoken on some issues for education. I think you should run for Congress. And I say, you know what? I've been thinking about it. Two students have come to me, now you guys. And so I float this idea, right, at a party meeting or uh, with a group of people at um, the Chamber of Commerce or a group of people at the Rotary Club. And they say, yeah. You should run for Congress, we'll support you. These, this is my personal constituency. Whenever I think about my constituency, I'm, I just run for Congress and I have won. And so the first people I think about when I define who my constituency are is college students and faculty and university generally, right? Uh, that teachers uh, group that I went to. These are the people that I consider to be my personal constituency so that whenever I come back to the district, um, I say, hey, what are you guys thinking on this? And I listen. All right. The second is the primary group. So if I need to get elected, I mean, you guys did vote at 27%, um, which is a new high for you. Nonetheless, I know that you're not going to give me a third of the vote, right? Or maybe you'll give me a third of the vote because you like me so much. That's possible, right? Okay. So this is a possibility, um, but there's got to be somebody else I'm looking at. So who do I need to win my primary in the party I choose? Who do I need? I need enough people who are on board. And so I start looking around and I look at this district, this is Tom Cole's district, like I told you earlier, right? And I say, oh, there's also Tinker Air Force Base. There's also uh, Comanche County. There's a lot of rural land between here. There's an army base. There's farmers, there's ranchers, there's oil. I need to get some of them on my side, right? Because I need to win the primary. And then beyond that primary, I also need to win a general election or re-election. So I need to listen to them and what their needs are. And then I think about my district 
not in terms of the rest of the people who didn't vote for me. I think of it in terms of geography. Okay? So there are universities, there's a lot of uh, oil and gas, there are farms and ranches, there's some plains, there are rolling hills, uh, we have a lot of water in that area, but not as much as in other areas in Oklahoma. Right? That doesn't sound like a lot of people involved in that. And so this is a way that members of Congress think about their district. And they represent their actions in Congress. I voted this way. I um, authored this bill. I, I um, co-authored this or I voted against this. They represent their actions the same exact way to every one of these constituencies. Okay? And that's important because that means what? If I'm talking to you guys who told me to vote, who told me to run, said, hey, we're going to support you, we want you to run. And so if I'm talking to you about that, and I'm telling you, well, I voted this way for this reason, and I'm also telling the general public that, then what can you take away from that? What can you take away from that? That I am a lying liar who lies? Or perhaps that I'm being consistent and truthful, right? This is genuinely why I voted this way, right? This is what I did. If I am representing it the same way to all these groups, then I'm telling the people I feel closest to the same thing that I'm telling people that I don't care about because they're never going to vote about why I did Members of Congress, finally, what he finds out is this, and this is significant, okay? Beginning in the early 70s, we start seeing a trend of members of Congress running for Congress by running against the institution. I always talk about the Jim Inhofe ad at this particular point. Okay, Jim Inhofe, he is an outgoing senator, he has retired, but he has this ad that is fantastic. It is a perfect ad. Understand, Jim Inhofe has been in Congress since 1974. Um, 1974. And this is about 2010, 2008, something like that, whenever, right in there, whenever his Senate election was a couple of terms ago. And so he's been in the Senate for a while at that point, too. But this ad, he is walking through a golden wheat field. There's a nimbus coming off his head and the wheat around him. There's an old fashioned windmill. That he walks by. He goes and sits down on the steps of a log cabin. And he's been talking this whole time. Okay? But it does not matter what he said. I don't remember what he said. All I remember is this the visuals of this that he says, send me to Washington to represent Oklahoma guy. Like he'd never been there, right? At that point, he had been in Congress for over 30 years. It's a fantastic ad. This idea that Washington was so corrupt that that was not him, and it did not matter that he'd been there for 30 years. It's amazing. Respected. It's a good ad. Yeah, and right? He tried it with uh, Luke Holland, his chief of staff or whatever that same kind of ad and it just didn't work it was kind of surprising yeah so whenever he was um, in the primary his chief of staff was running and did the same thing but his chief of staff did not have uh, quite too many golden embassies let me take attendance but yeah so eric will you take attendance yes thank you well it's live so um Right after this, I'm going to take a poll, too. And I have two polls today. It's very exciting. So while you guys are taking attendance, I want to remind you of a few things. Your topic for your How to Save the World problem is due on Friday. 
Okay. I've gotten a few emails saying, hey, what about this? To which I said, that sounds good. Or that sounds a little odd. Bring it in. Right? The economy. A little dark. Okay. Um, you know, uh, when we talk about things like that, think about that, focusing your topic, the topic, the topic that we do. And then also for Friday, you need to read the two readings that are up under module two, like module 12 for this week. Okay. Because number one, they will be on the exam. Number two, you'll need them for your lab. Okay. Number one, on the exam. Number two, you'll need them for your lab. All right. And then um, something about that that just went out of my head. All right. You're on the final exam, too. Yeah, I said the exam, right? Yeah. Okay, I said the exam, and I said you need them for lab. There's something else about that. It's going to come back to me. <coughs> Okay, so let's talk about how your elected rep officials should represent. The first option is as a trustee. Representatives are elected to use their own best judgment. Okay, so if we elect representatives to use their own best judgment, what are we saying if that's what we prefer? If I am elected, if you elect me to go serve in Congress for you, and you want me to use my own best judgment, why? Why do you want me to do that? Because you trust me, specifically, all right? What else? Because that's number one, yeah. Okay, you voted for me, so I must have similar views that you do, okay? What else? So I don't have to think about everything, right? And so, because the idea is you trust me, you voted for me, we must be somewhat similar. And finally, this is my job, right? You don't want to think about trade with Macau. You don't want to think about it, right? What should the foreign policy response be to Iran saying that they are going to execute 15,000 protesters? Do you want to think about it? What do you want me to think about? A trustee is saying exactly that. You want me to use my best judgment. A delegate, the representatives are going to vote the way their constituents want them to, no matter what. So let's talk about those protesters. Okay. How many of you favor? A military strike against Iran in order to prevent the execution of the 15,000 protesters. Raise your hand. How many of you favor increased economic sanctions to end to uh, punish Iran for the execution of protesters? One, two, three, four, five. How many of you think we should stay out of Iran and say nothing at all? One, two, that's not a lot, right? A lot of you have no idea about what should be done here. And so that means that my job is to maybe look at some classified information, top secret stuff. And if I were to go with, hey, I pulled my constituency and it's three to two, so let's do economic sanctions, then that's certainly not taking into account everyone, right? So, third option. Let it go. Representatives act as 
as trustee or delegate, depending on the salience of the issue. Salience means you know something about it and you have an opinion about it, right? In that case, you want me to ask, ask how? As a trustee or a delegate? Delegate. You want me to behave as a delegate, okay? If you know what it is and you have an opinion about it, as a whole, if it's salient, then you want me to ask, act as a delegate. But if you don't, you want me to act as a trustee. That's a political, okay? So here's your quick poll, poll number one of the day. All right, which one do you want? Now, I have just talked to you this entire first part of this lecture, which I understand seems like almost all the class, um, has been about how representatives act as individuals, right? This second part, okay, and this is important to understand, is a congressional representation as a whole. Can either be substantive or descriptive. Substantive or descriptive. Substantive means essentially this. The majority of the policies, the majority of the time, reflect what the majority of the people want. Pickin looks at Congress in 1968, and she says, yeah, this is how Congress behaves. The majority of people, the majority of time, Congress behaves in a way, passes laws the way the majority of the people want them to act. Descriptive representation means this, that Congress as a whole, the body of Congress, looks like we the people, okay, in terms of politically relevant characteristics. So what's politically relevant? What are politically relevant characteristics? Any guesses? Trustworthiness. What? Trustworthiness. Uh, that's not a characteristic that is viewable in terms of mirroring the population. Mirroring the population. What do we got? Demographics. Personal characteristics. What are politically relevant? What's politically relevant? Yes. <laughs> um, that's a broader question. But I mean, if I look at this class and I want Congress, I cannot look like this class, right? Why not? If you if you're looking in the mirror and you look at me, do I look like you? Do I? But I look like some of you in some ways, right? <coughs> what are those ways? What? I'm female. So women, raise your hand. Descriptively, I can represent you on that politically relevant characteristic. Okay? What else? What else do you see about me? I'm white. Okay? How many of you are white? Raise your hand or identify as white. Raise your hand. Okay, then on that politically relevant characteristic, I can descriptively represent you. Obviously, a person, right, cannot descriptively represent the United States as a whole, right? Which means the question is, does Congress as a whole descriptively represent what the nation looks like? Let's look. It also doesn't matter, right? The other question. The first question is about substantiveness, though. <clears throat> and is Congress representing substantively? In 1968, they were. But when we look at the answer between 1990 and 2012, we find out no, they're not. Congress represents the wealthy and corporate interests, not what the majority of people want. So that is an issue, right? That's something we've talked about, we will talk about. 
So if you think substantive representation is the most important thing, then you need to think about those issues you care about and electing people who are representing you on those issues because that substance matters more to you. In terms of descriptive representation, members of Congress are more likely to be male. They're older, they're better educated. 96% of members of Congress right now have a college degree. Okay? They're more likely to be white and they're more likely to be very wealthy. Why does it matter? The main reason is agenda setting. When we talk about this, I, I, I always give this particular example. It's of a Nevada elected House of Representatives member in the 1970s. She's female. She owns a giant ranch. She's a Republican. And she goes to the bank and says, hey, I would like to expand my ranch. These are my, this is my paperwork. This is what I've got. And so I want to put up what I already have against expanding the ranch, right? And the bank says, hey, everything looks great here. We would love to give you a loan. Just bring your husband in. He says, I'm a widow. And then she's looking, he's like, so you have like a brother or father or something that can represent you? The bank would not give her a loan and could refuse her because she was female. She ran for Congress, was elected. The very first thing what she did was sponsor an equity in banking that said, hey, you cannot discriminate against someone in giving loans on the basis of their sex alone. Congress, which was overwhelmingly male, passed it like that. The difference was, because it was overwhelmingly male, they never had that experience. Right? So when you talk about agenda setting, you're talking about things that you have experienced yourself. It also makes a difference in terms of committee activity. Women and men behave differently in committee. People of color bring different experiences. People who come from poverty bring different experiences. They see things differently. And the other reason it matters is this. If you look at government and it doesn't look like you at all, if you cannot find people in government that look like you, then government is them. It's not us. If you cannot connect with the people in government, if you do not see yourself, then you're then the efficacy of the people breaks down. Efficacy means the connectedness between people and government. It means lots of things to see now. So if you look it up on the internet, you won't necessarily come up with that definition. So I'm telling you, this is the political science definition of this. Efficacy means this, connectedness between people and government. The degree to which people are connected to their government. So let's look at women in Congress really quickly. This is the last Congress, not the most recent numbers, uh, because we don't have them yet. Um, but as you can see, the number of women in Congress has been increasing. The blue is um, uh, Democratic women, the red is Republican women. Um, women make up the, of the last Congress about 27% of Congress. So that's equal to the amount of women in the population, correct? No. That's about half, right? So women are very underrepresented in Congress. Okay, very half. This is a growing racial and ethnic diversity in Congress. Um, six Native American members, uh, 17 Asian members, 46 uh, Latino members, 59 uh, Black members of Congress. All right? 
Now, that means let's take uh, the Black Caucus, that's about 11%. All right. Is that half Black America or more than that? How close is it? What percentage of the United States is African American? About 13. So 11% to 13%, pretty close to descriptive representation. Yeah, actually it is. All right. Uh, the Latino numbers are lower, right? Um, and so it's going to be at about 9 to 10%, 9%, I think, as opposed to 14% in the population. Okay. Um, Asian members are lower as well, but it is pretty close to their numbers in the population. It's like four to six. And then um, Native Americans for the first time actually have more people in Congress as a percentage um, than in the population, right? That just happened. Younger generation is gonna make up an increasing share of the US Congress. That's you guys. You think that that is a politically relevant characteristic? I mean, we can look at the vote returns from this past week and say, hey, look, younger people voted differently than older people did. So it's politically relevant. Women vote differently than men do, et cetera. It's politically relevant. So we're going to see increases there. We're going to see the same thing here. Uh, changes in religious makeup of U.S. Congress. It's about 88% Christian in the U.S. Congress. Uh, the population is about 70 to 75 percent. Christians are certainly overrepresented in Congress. There's no question about that, but it is um, having some increasing diversity. But there are far fewer veterans than there once were, though it is closer to the amount in the population. But if you see veterans and military service as a way to go into public service, then that's clearly a decline. Like I said, almost every single member is a college degree, and we have more um, two spirit, lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans, questioning members, um, asexual members uh, than uh, ever before. Two senators, nine members of the House, half were elected in 2018. And so, my question for you to think about is which is more important to you, substantive, descriptive, district level, or national interest representation? 